Good morning, please come, uh, good afternoon, I'm so sorry. <laughs> please come on in and find your seat. Uh, we'll give a, ourselves a minute or two here to allow a few people to come on in and get settled in and then we'll start. Good afternoon, we'll go ahead and start. We'll call the meeting to order. And this is the June 29th Sustainable Communities Working Group meeting. And thank you all for coming. Uh, we do have a, a, we appear to have a quorum now and we're expecting a few other people to join us a little bit late. So that's exciting. Um, oh, good, thank you. Yeah. <laughs> Just a reminder, my name is Joy Lines. I'm the deputy mayor for the city of Encinitas and the new chair for this working group. And so bear with me as I uh, get familiar with you and I see people I know and other people I haven't really had a chance to meet yet. So um, happy to see you all here today. So what we'll start with is just letting you know that um, this is in replace of our regular meeting on um, yeah, okay, I'm reading my notes here. <laughs> a regular meeting on July 20th, and we will instead have a joint working group forum scheduled for July 27th um, with uh, that uh, we have been invited to. So staff will give us a little bit more information on this as we move through our agenda. Uh, so before we get any further, I'd like to ask Francesca, our clerk, to do a roll call and confirm, confirm that we have a quorum. Thank you, Chair, we do have a quorum. Okay, no roll call. Oh. <laughs> My apologies, I was <laughs> trying to assist a member. Um, I can go ahead with the roll call. For the city of Carlsbad, Rob Efford. Present. For the city of Chula Vista, uh, the city of Chula Vista is absent. For the city of Coronado, Jesse Brown. Here. For the county of San Diego, Lynette Santos. Present. For the city of Del Mar, Amanda Lee. Here. The city of El Cajon is absent. For the city of Encinitas, Crystal Nahara. Here. For the city of Escondido, Adam Feinstone. I'm sorry, the city of Escondido is absent. Uh, for the city of Imperial Beach, Megan Oppenshaw. Present. For the city of La Mesa, Sandy Hazelwood. Present. <clears throat> for the city of Lemon Grove, Michael Fellows. I'm sorry, the city of uh, Lemmy Grove is absent. The city of National City and the city of Oceanside and Poway are also absent. For the city of San Diego, Heidi Von Blum. Here. Or I'm sorry, is it Von Blum? Doesn't matter. Okay. Von Blum. Thank you. <laughs> My apologies. Uh, for the city of San Marcos, Saima Kershe. Uh, yes, here. For the city of Santee, Michael Coyne. Present. The city of Solana Beach and the city of Vista are absent. And that concludes the roll call. Thank you. Uh, so as far as how we will uh, uh, process our questions and comments today, if you're on the working group, please just raise your hand and then I'll take you in the order that I see you around the table. And then Francesca, um, are you prepared to uh, give a little bit of a quick reminder on how the public comment will work? Yes, I can do that. Thank you, Chair. Uh, if you're a member of the public here in the room and would like to provide comments on an item, please submit a speaker slip. The speaker slips are in the lobby uh, and provide that to me prior to the start of the item, or I'm sorry, prior to the conclusion of the item's presentation. Um, if you're a member of the public joining us on Zoom, please raise your virtual hand for the item you'd like to comment on when it begins. And uh, members of the public will be called on first, followed by the virtual commenters, and you'll be referred to by name or the last three digits of, the, of your telephone number. 
and that's all chair thank you great thank you we'll proceed on to our agenda item number one which is communications member comments and public comments um let's see so we'll start with public comment do we have any public comments francesca thank you chair we have no public comments on this item okay thanks uh now uh carrie simmons will give a uh, summary a few announcements before we get started Great. Okay, good morning or good afternoon, everybody. Um, just a couple announcements here. First, I wanted to start it off with a congratulations to the city of Del Mar and Solana Beach for both getting approved housing elements, super exciting. Um, so congratulations on all that hard work. Um, I have a couple announcements in the form of just some reminders on some upcoming trainings and uh, forums that Sandeg is holding. And so the first, uh, the chair mentioned we're holding another joint working group forum at the library for those of you who attended our last one in February. We do a whole bunch of table activities. It's focused on uh, the 2025 regional plan update um, and the work, this working group has been invited to it. And so I'll be sending out calendar holds and more information on that. But we'd really love to have participation there. Um, it's gonna be a fun event. Uh, the second, um events that i wanted to mention are two from our housing technical assistance program that i wanted most of you probably are aware of a lot of things we do but i just wanted to highlight that in case you want to send staff we're having one coming up on july 18th it's virtual and we're going to be going over um upcoming bills in the 2023 legislative cycle and giving all people opportunity to understand some of the new bills that might be coming out and ask questions to our consultants and our project team so that's the first one the second is a training on july 25th where we're focusing on anti-displacement and we wanted to collect a little input and share some more information on our anti-displacement training that we will be holding and that's going to be followed by some focused group sessions in august so just want to make everyone aware of that and i'll definitely be sending out more information and then finally, this will be touched on in our first uh, item that you hear today, but we are holding a Series 15 task force meeting on July 19th. And so I want to put that on everybody's radar. You probably might have heard about this already, and uh, you'll hear, hear a little bit more about it later, but it'll be virtual and we'll be touching on some Series 15 items. And that is it. And we'll have another announcement from uh, Natasha here as well. It on? Oh, sorry about that. I'll redo it. <laughs> My name is Natasha Dulek. I'm a planner here at uh, Sandeg on the climate team, and I don't have a full presentation today, but want to provide a quick update on our regional resilience framework, uh, previously known as the roadmap, but uh, that provides some guidance for jurisdictions uh, regarding holistic adaptation planning um, and best practices. And the framework will also include some tools that the jurisdictions can use for addressing climate hazards um, and some implementation in the future. Uh, but wanna make sure that you all know we're going to be hosting a meeting with uh, local sustainability staff on the 26th. And we'll be talking with everyone about the tools, trying to get some feedback. Um, so I wanna make sure that your staff is aware and hopefully able to attend. Um, I'll be sending it out later today, but uh, it'll be virtual. So hopefully everyone can make it. Um, and then as far as next steps for the project, we're going to be coming back to this uh, group in September. I think that's when your next meeting is to provide a full update on the project as well as uh, hear some feedback on our framework drafts. So I uh, look forward to making a meeting with you all then. Uh, thank you. And again, my name is Natasha Dulick, so feel free to reach out if you have any questions. Thank you, Natasha. Are there any questions for Natasha or Carrie from the working group? Seeing none, um, thank you is uh, now is an opportunity for the working group to either make any announcements or share any information that you'd like to before we start our regular uh, next item on our agenda. Anyone interested? All right, great, we'll move on. Our first item on the agenda is approval of our minutes. Um, actually, it's the second item, item number two. And uh, do I have a motion for approval? So moved. Thank you, Sandy. <laughs> I have a seating chart. Um, thank you. Is there a second? Second. Thank you. I'll take uh, Todd's second there. Um, and uh, is there anyone who wants to speak on the minutes? Then we will move to, I'm trying to figure out if we need to have a roll call. 
I uh, did want to note for the record uh, that we don't have any public comment on this item before we move Thank forward you for that. with the motion. <laughs> Thank uh, you so much for keeping me on track. Um, now we'll call for raised hands on the vote. So all those in favor, raise your hand. Any opposed? Any abstain? We have one abstention. Oh, two abstentions. Thank you. Did you get this? Could you know which jurisdictions abstain for me? I didn't catch that. Carlsbad. Thank Carlsbad. you. And Solana, Solana Beach. Beach. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, and for the record, that uh, item passes unanimously other than those two abstentions. Okay. So uh, we will go on uh, to item number three. And uh, item number three is series 15 regional growth forecast update. Um, we will have this uh, presentation from Dr. Sydney Burke. Welcome. Thank you. Good afternoon, Chair Lines and working group members. I'm pleased to be here today to share the preliminary results of our Series 15 regional growth forecast. I am the Senior Director of Data Science here at Sandag, and I also am joined by Beth Giroux online, who is a consultant with us, who's working with different MPOs across the um, state as well as the country to make sure that we're using the best, po best possible methodology. So it's important to consider what a forecast is and what it isn't. And I know that you've all been to this rodeo probably many times before, but just as a, a reminder, the Series 15 forecast is a projection using a cohort component model of likely future population, housing and jobs based on the consideration of a variety of factors, including historical trends. It's informed by expert input through a series of peer review panels, as well as comparing our assumptions and predictions to other models. Thank you including those used by other MPOs in California. It is also a key input for the regional transportation plan. What isn't it? It isn't a crystal ball because any forecast is not perfect. We're not making assumptions about future technology, economic or policy change. And it's also not the regional housing needs assessment arena, and it does not supersede local plans and policies. What I will be sharing with you today is also not the sub-regional forecast where numbers will be allocated to your jurisdictions, and it's also not the Sustainable Community Strategy, SCS. This is really the high-level numbers for the region that we're going to be starting out with. We update our forecast every four years to take the latest data into account, and our Series 15 forecast uses a base year of 2022, which is important because it's after the pandemic. Obviously, we know how much um, our regions have changed in our jurisdictions, and it goes out to 2060. But it's also important to note that the regional plan we're working on only will go out till 2050, so we have 10 extra years of data to consider um, both in the short and long term. A good deal of information and data are compiled and prepared for the forecast. And before I get into it, I don't know about you, but when I'm reading a book, I cheat to the end and see what the ending sometimes is. So I'm going to give you, this is the ending when we get to the end. Um, first, we're going to see that the region's population, which takes into account birth rates, death rates, and migration, increases until about 2040. And then it's going to decrease. And in 2060, it will be 1% lower than it is today. This is obviously a significant change and not something that we've seen before. Second, our population is going to be getting older. In 2022, and for the number geeks out there, our median age right now is 36. By the time we get to 2060, it's going to be 42. Six years is a significant jump, and um, I can make fun of Florida because I was born in Florida. We're going to look like Florida. Florida's median age right now is, is 42.7. And the six-year increase in the median age is significant because it's going to have implications for the number of households. Um, individuals who are older are more likely to live alone or just with one other person. Younger, younger individuals are more likely to live with roommates or with families. So even though the population will eventually be going down, we'll be having the need for more households in the region. And then our prediction related to the number of jobs, this is going to be really different when you see these numbers, because with Series 15, as opposed to Series 14, which we use for the 2021 regional plan, we um, have now considered non-wage and salary jobs. And I, I was not as familiar with these since I've worked at Sandag almost my entire career, but 1099s, those people who are real estate agents, consultants, Uber drivers, we didn't have those data in our job forecast. So it looks like our jobs went up a lot, but it's a different data source, but it helps us better understand who's going around the region and what travel is going to be looking like. And we also are making assumptions about labor force participation rates of older individuals increasing. So that means the impact that we're going to have more jobs in the region 
uh, this rate of growth will slow as we um, go out further um, towards 2060, but that has implications for obviously people coming from outside the region to fill those jobs. So as I mentioned, our population forecast reflects assumptions regarding births, deaths, and net migration. The green line on this graph shows historical data on births and our forecast out till again 2060. We've been seeing births for younger age categories falling for more than a decade, and for older age categories, they've been stable or shown small increases. By 2060, we're expecting the birth rate will be lower than it was in 2021, again, because people are getting older, um, and the total fertility rate will be 1.4 instead of the 1.56 we saw in 2021. The blue line at the bottom shows the number of deaths in the region. And as you look at the historical data from 1991 to 2021, you can see that we had some increases there that reflects the pandemic as well as something that's called deaths of despair. We've seen increases related to alcohol use, um, other drug use, mental health issues. Our model assumes there'll be improvements in infant mortality, but that rates will be stable for the other ages. And with an aging population, you can see that there will be over 40,000 deaths by the time we get to 2060, which is considerably higher than those numbers we saw in 2021. And then finally, the uh, purple pinkish line um, is net migration, and that considers both domestic and foreign migration people coming in, um, as well as from out of the country in and out of San Diego region. And for the past two decades, net domestic migration has been an outflow. We've all he heard stories about people moving um, to other states, especially with telecommuting, which has become more common. And that's been an outflow. And while international migration has typically been positive, it's not been enough to offset the outflow that we've seen in recent years with different federal policies, as well as the effect of the pandemic. And so based on these assumptions, you can see that the net migration is estimated to be relatively flat. So here's the, the big story, population projection summary, the first set of stats that I'll be sharing with you. This slide shows the historic change we've seen in the region's population, including decreases the past few years. We've actually had a popul population decrease in 20, 2020 and 2021. And the purple, um, I'm sorry, the orange line is our series 15 forecast. The green line is series 14, which we used again for the 2021 regional plan. The blue line is used by Caltrans um, from the California Economic Forecast. And then we also have DOF's forecast, and that um, is the Vintage 2020. You'll see it's in purple. And we have a down arrow there because those numbers have not been updated. We're waiting for the updated projections to come out. They were supposed to come out in April, and um, our, our team is basically checking the website five times a day trying to see when it is because we want to finalize our numbers. We had um, the head of DOF on our most recent PRP, and he shared when he saw our numbers that their numbers will be very close to ours. They are also going to be predicting a decrease because they have the updated information um, since the pandemic. So we're forecasting that the San Diego region's population will grow in the short term, but will begin to decline at some point after 2035, reaching around 3.32 million in 2050, which again is the horizon for our regional plan, and um, 3.26 in 2060. This reflects net migration near zero, low fertility, and an aging population. And the Series 15 projection is a departure from prior forecasts, but it's not as low as the one used by Caltrans. So how does the population look? We know I've mentioned it's growing older, um, that the numbers are going to be going down eventually. But as you can see um, here, both for the region and nationally, um, we have 2022 in the bottom uh, line graph and 2060 above. In 2060, the percent of the population that identifies as white will decrease five percentage points, and those that will identify as Asian will increase by the same amount. This reflects expected migration um, into the region. And I was surprised when I saw the percent of uh, Hispanic Latino staying at 34 four percent um, and it not increasing because I that was contrary to what I expected but it really reflects a trend of lower birth, birth rates among um, individuals who identify as, as Hispanic as well as a higher outflow from the region into other areas and again um, just because this age data is so um, drastic we thought this um, slide would do a good job of showing this. If you look at, um, we have data from 2000, 2010, 2020, and 2060. And when you look at the burgundy bar on the right, in 20, 2000 and 2010, only about one in 10 individuals were 65 years of age and over. But by the time we get to 2060, you see that's going to be one in four, which really has some significant policy and programmatic implications for the region. So now turning to households. Um, 
we need to consider the number of households in the region and the aging of the population, as I mentioned, affects um, household formation rate and thus the number of households we expect to see in the region. And as I said before, younger individuals are more likely to live with roommates, to live with families. So you can see that only about 11% of individuals who are between 15 and 24 are considered head of household. And that rate goes up um, to 58, 59% as we get with the older individuals. So even though population will be going down because of that aging population, the type of housing that might be needed um, will be different than what we're seeing today. And there may be more um, smaller median household sizes. So looking at the uh, need for households, um, our series 15 forecast predicts that the number of households will increase until about 2050. You can see the 1.3 million from 1.16 in 2022, while there will be a slight decline through 2060. This projection is lower than we had with series 14, as well as the one used by Caltrans. Um, the current version of the DOF forecast only goes to 2030, and we're waiting on again on the updated numbers from them. So now we did population, we've done households, now turning to, I'm sorry, housing, households, and now turning to the housing. So when we're looking at housing, which I know is everyone's favorite topic, especially Rena, um, the model starts with housing stock, excluding group quarters, which could include dorms, um, individuals who live in um, retirement communities, which obviously is gonna go up over time, military housing. And we consider how many are occupied and what the vacancy rate is for owned and rented properties. And as the slide on the left shows, um, owned units have lower vacancy rates, the orange bars, consider, compared to those of the rental. Um, in our forecast, we're expecting that there's going to be about a 2% vacancy rate for owner-occupied units. And for rental units, we're assuming a vacancy rate of around 5% for the duration of the forecast period. These changes reflect trends already underway as increased construction and slower population growth led to an increase in rental vacancy rates over the past year. Another complexity, which I know many of your jurisdictions are dealing with, is vacation rentals and second homes. Um, you can see the variability in the percent of housing units that are not for sale or rent, often seasonal or vacation rental homes since 1990. And we're currently forecasting that the rate will be around 4% for 2025 out to 2060. Um, another thing that may come up as a question when we're discussing this afterwards is ADUs. And a lot of the information that we're hearing on ADUs is that they may be being built, but they're not actually creating a lot of additional housing stock for people um, coming in. And so we welcome your feedback on that from your jurisdictions. Another consideration as we forecast housing units is the um, variance in the number of housing units built over time annually as shown with the gray bars and our estimates for how many were built, will be built through 2050, which again reflects our population and household trends. It's important to note that this does not reflect permit data, but actual change in the number of housing units available. We have not no net change. You can see the, um, the, the dash line for 2055 and 2060 as the population will be declined in those 10 years after our, our most recent, again, just to remind everybody, we're going to 2050 for this next regional plan. So housing stock's an important consideration for your jurisdiction. This next slide shows our historic data on housing as well as our series 15 forecasted numbers compared to series 14, DOF does not um, do this type of forecast. And you can see that we're forecasting our housing numbers to increase to around 1.41 uh, million by 2050. And this again is assuming that all policies are staying the same in the region and that this number will remain stable through 2060. We don't think that when the population starts going down that housing units are necessarily gonna be torn down, but they might be more um, reconstruction of them or reconfiguring of the housing that is available. So now the final uh, data set, jobs. Turning to jobs, you'll see that our series 15 numbers look very different from series 14. And some of this may seem counterintuitive when you see increases going up, even though we're saying the population is gonna eventually be decreasing. This reflects the fact we're using different data sources that include the non-wage and salary workers, as well as wage and salary workers to better account for the different types of jobs in the region. For example, over the past decade, we've seen that non-wage and salary jobs have increased 23%, while those wage and salary jobs have only uh, increased 15%. Our assumptions were updated to reflect a higher labor force participation rate by older individuals, and because our predicted job growth exceeds our population, they are may be in effect uh, for the need for workers to come in from outside the region. And just so you know, we've also taken into consideration this job growth and how that might affect migration into the region. 
So this slide shows how the proportion of jobs in different sectors that were wage and salary or non-wage and salary can vary. And these are 2021 data. And you can see that a greater proportion of real estate jobs were non-wage and salary, which were, uh, reflects those real estate agents who uh, work on commission and transportation and warehouse, um, which includes the Uber and Lyft drivers. In comparison, most of the jobs in manufacturing, accommodation and food service um, for, and professional services are wage and salary. And the takeaway we want to do to get from this slide is that in the series 14 forecast, all of the green bars were essentially not included in our job number. So when you see this big jump, this is why. And also turning to our assumption on individuals in the labor force, um, it's important to consider how many people we are forecasting in the population in the different age groups and also what the group's labor force participation rate is. So looking at those bars in the middle of the slide, you can see that individuals between 25 and 64 make up the largest proportion of the workforce and their labor force participation rate is expected to increase between 2022 and 2060 from 0.74 to 0.79. The proportion of those 65 and older, they make up less of the um, population, but you can see their labor force participation will be going up from 0.18 to 0.24, and that those um, who are between the ages of 16 and 24 will actually be going down. And so with declining population, again, trying to think of all the implications, job growth is possible through individuals having more than one job. And um, by having individuals who live outside the region um, working on those jobs. And we wanted to provide some data here just as context. This is our best guess estimate on different historical data from the um, ACS and the census, as well as data about who crosses the border, telling us that they have a job in the San Diego region. And so over the forecast period, we expect the jobs filled by interregional commuters to ride, rise modestly from about 11% to 12% based on the population growth that is forecast for those other areas. And this map highlights the historical estimates on the number of jobs filled by individuals who come from neighboring counties and individuals coming from Mexico. So um, as this slide shows, our forecast for the number of jobs in the region, and again, it's jobs, not employees, will continue to grow even past 2050, unlike population, households, and housing. This slide also shows how those two different measures of jobs vary historically when we just considered the wage and salary jobs in series 14, but we added the non-wage and salary jobs in series 15. So this final data slide, no, we're throwing a lot of numbers at you, shows our projections together for population, jobs, housing, stock, and household. Again, between 2022 and 2050, the horizon year for the next regional plan, we will, will uh, project our population will increase from 3.29 million to 3.32 million. The number of households will increase from 1.16 million to 1.3 million. Our housing stock will increase from 1.24 million to 1.41 million. And the number of jobs will increase from 2.14 million to 2.39 million. And I promise I won't quiz you on all these numbers when we're done. Um, when we look even further out to 2060, again, that's where we start seeing some of the decreases, including the population, number of households and housing stability, even though the jobs will continue to grow more slowly. So what does this possibly mean? Um, th these are the insights from a data scientist and, and not a planner. So really welcome your input today as we get into this. But one of the um, most significant is the changes in the population and the population characteristics how affect how they will um, get around the region, when they will get around the region. Um, similarly, our changing demographics has implications for the needs of the population. I know um, you all are concerned with more than just transportation when you're thinking about parks and infrastructure and adult daycare centers. Um, parks may need fewer, fewer play structures and more uh, benches and pickleball courts. And as household compositions change, there may be more of a desire for housing and age-appropriate housing. And so in terms of what happens next, we're waiting for DOF to release their uh, interim projections in case any final updates are uh, going to be needed to our model and the numbers you saw today to ensure we're within their 1.5% of their projected numbers. In July, we have a number of things going on. We'll have our next Series 15 task force, group, task force Group meeting, and we will also be sharing an abbreviated version of this with our Board of Directors on July 28th, and we will be working with you to compile a jurisdictional input through July 31st. Um, that doesn't mean that the input can't be provided after that, but we're trying to get as much as we can by then, and um, I understand that we've spoken with every jurisdiction to some degree at least um, once except for one. 
Um, we're going to be working on the sub-regional forecast, again, starting from our regional totals and working down. And our goal is to be done with that by December of this year. And then, then we'll be working, continuing our work on the sustainable community scenario, again, with the planning uh, group, as well as your jurisdictions. And we want to hopefully complete that by April of 2024. And I'm going to take this opportunity just to do one last plug. Um, one of the goals of Sandag is to be a data-driven agency. And we launched an open data portal last year. Three of the data sets that are on here, including sustainable development goals, employment centers, and community characteristics, um, are the data sets that we're hoping that you can use, can be of use, and that we can reach out to you to get your input about how they can be most useful. So I was going to be reaching out to you in the near future. So I didn't want that to be a surprise or shock, but just we really want to make sure that if we're doing data work, that it's something that's useful for you and that you feel that it, it is valid and reliable information. So I welcome your input in advance. So that is my presentation and I'm happy to answer any questions. And again, um, Beth, our technical advisor is also online as well as some SANDAG staff who are key in this work. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Burke. That, that's a, this is a great opportunity for this working group to have asked questions and provide comments as well as it's really informative that you've also identified that you will continue to reach out to seek input. So we'll start with the working group as far as any questions or comments and then we'll go to the public. Uh, anyone in the working group have a question they want to start with? I'll start over here with Lynette. Thank you so much for that presentation. Could you clarify the relationship between the higher death rates and but an older population? So you're saying our population is getting older, but the death rates are increasing? I'm going to try to answer that, and I have Beth on, who's our demographer, if further explanation is needed. So we know that when people are getting older, more the proportion, uh, older individuals mean more deaths. And so there's this number of assumptions about the death rate by age group. So we're assuming that infant mortality rate will get better over time. The death rates for other population groups will stay the same, but because more people are older, that means that more there will be more absolute deaths. Beth, do, do, would you add anything there? No, that was perfect. Okay, um, then we'll go, I think I saw a hand to the right. Uh, yes, Heidi. Uh, thank you. I do have a couple of questions. Um, one is I do just want to flag that um, I want to make sure that as the growth forecasts are being released, that there's going to be adequate messaging and communication about the continued need for housing. Um, so just because um, we are projecting um, the population flattening, we have pent up demand um, and sort of at this time, um, infinite needs for additional housing. Um, and then my other question is that you note the aging demographics. Um, and I think that, um, well, for the next item um, that we'll be talking about, um, one of um, our comments from City of San Diego is going to relate to the lack of housing um, for families with children and inter intergenerational families. And just wanted to flag that perhaps that is something that is um, uh, factoring in um, to the growth forecasts. Um, and maybe at least if there can be some asterisk um, that if we can um, collectively as a region change our housing policies to get us a housing product type and stock that is more family friendly than those um, could be subject to change as we move forward. Definitely. We look forward to working with you on that. Yes, um, I think I can read your, is it Michael? No, Corey. Yes, Michael. Michael. Okay. <laughs> um, will your data be a little more get granular, like on the census track level, so that every individual uh, jurisdiction can project what their population needs will be in the future in terms of, you know, an aging population? That's what we'll be doing when we do the sub-regional, and that data will definitely be open data and shared with you all. Yes, Rob. Thank you, Dr. Burke. Uh, just to regroup on the ADU question, you, you said uh, what your understanding was that that would be additional units, but not necessarily uh, for more households or more individuals. So I sit on the technical working group, and I know that we said a lot of the data is preliminary, so we didn't really see any trends, um, but I don't know that uh, generalization that they would just be more units and not necessarily for more households. Uh, I, I don't know that I heard that from the group, so maybe we can discuss that further offline. No, that would be great. It was something that I heard was anecdotal, and that's why I shared it with this group. I wouldn't want to put that out there as a policy thing, but definitely want to get your input because I'm not sure how much data is really out there on that, but definitely. Thank you. Thank you. Amanda. 
it's related to that topic. Actually, in Del Mar, that is the experience is they're not being used for housing units. Uh, yes, Sandy. And on the other side, <laughs> La Mesa, we are using them as dwelling units. Good to know. Uh, Patsy. Yeah. Or did I get your name right? I'm Corey from Solana Beach. Oh, Corey. <laughs> and I think it would just really depend on wh where you're at and kind of the income level of your location. <laughs> Um, I have a, a kind of a new new member question. Uh, you may have covered it, but if you could go into it a little bit more detail, how does the cost of housing play into what you're presenting as far as future population? So um, I may defer to, to Beth on this because obviously we know that there's a number of different policy changes. I mentioned, you know, we're not assuming policy changes here. Um, and the affordability of the region could either attract people or not, and that's associated obviously with the vacancy rates. The um, so when we have a lot of the VRBOs or second homes, that affects the you know the effect of how many housing units there are and what the cost is. So definitely, if housing was more affordable, the we would expect to make assumptions about domestic migration. But my understanding is right now we have assumptions that the, that there's not going to be any significant policy changes in this. There could be more with the SCS. Um, Beth. It, please correct me if I got any of that wrong or if you want to add anything. No, all of that is correct. The only piece that I would add is toward the end of the forecast when population starts to go down, we do assume that um, the housing market starts to, uh, that that alone would be enough to start to, to shift home price or housing costs. And we do have a little more in migration toward the end of the forecast. That's a really interesting part of this analysis to me. Mm -hmm. Any any other comments or questions? Yes, Lynette. Can you explain a little bit about how the baseline is going to inform the SES? How is that going to be used? So we we it's going to be more. And again, Beth, please correct me if I'm I'm wrong on any of this. Um, my understanding is that we're going to be working on the subregional next with this regional working up to the regional total. And then once we have those subregional information, that's where we're going to be looking at the SES, which again is the policy scenarios for the regional plan. So the SES will add up to the regional total. Beth, anything to add there? Nothing. Else. Well, though, I guess there is one other part that um, the next step in all of this, and many of you have been engaged in the local data collection process. Um, we'll be taking this regional number and disaggregating it, and that will be done in close collaboration with all of you. It was a very thorough presentation. Um, any other final comments from the working group? Uh, with that, I'll ask if there are any public comments on this item. Thank you, Chair. We have two members of the public with hands raised on this item. We'll start with Blair Beekman and then go to Edmad. Hi, uh, Blair Beekman here. Uh, thank you very much for the meeting uh, today and this item. I wanted to try to quickly comment just kind of an overall view uh, of, of issues around housing at this time. Uh, both the city of San Jose and San Diego, uh, San Jose is where I'm from, San Diego is where I now live, have both just gone through some really trying issues around housing issues. And um, in San Jose, they've, they've had serious issues of quick build issues versus uh, uh, how to develop very uh, affordable, very low income affordable housing. And that was initially an argument. And it was like one side against another side. Uh, they eventually merged their argument together and realized they could work towards the same goal. And that we could talk about the term comprehensive. And I know San Diego has been trying to talk about the term comprehensive housing uh, and shelter programs, uh, but they haven't been able to. They've only talked about one portion of that with the public. And um, they've only talked about a few shelter ideas that are interesting and hopeful, but not very comprehensive. And uh, I just wanted to remind yourselves that it's okay to talk about different areas of housing and the preventative measures needed, tenant rights issues needed, uh, shelter services needed and, and, and housing development. And when you put all of that together, uh, hopefully we can trust that we can talk about comprehensive policy making. 
and we don't have to fear that. I know you're not allowed to at certain times and it's just not passe or it's not uh, 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 socially acceptable at a time, it's not cool, <laughs> but you can and we should. And that just a reminder of that and good luck how to, it, it, we need to talk about all the possibilities of this time and we're learning to do that and good luck on those continued good efforts, especially very low income affordable housing. To me, that's an important thing we have trouble talking about openly. Good luck in those efforts, thanks. Thank you for your comments. Chair, that actually concludes the public comments on that this. That concludes item. the public comment. Okay. Well, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Burke. We'll move on to item four overview of HCD's California's Next Housing Future 2024, or the next RHNA. To ARA, will give this, present this item. Thank you, Chair. Good afternoon, working group members. Uh, again, my name is Tuere Faola, and I am Principal Regional Planner here at SANAG, and I manage our Sustainable Communities team. I also have here um, Samantha Folk, who is with our, our General Counsel. Um, she is also very familiar with the sixth cycle of RENA, and I just want to make sure in case there are any questions or clarifications related to some of the statute or legislation, that uh, she's here to assist in some of those. But I'm gonna go through the presentation and then we can go into questions and comments. Okay, so just to start off, um, before I start, we primarily today want to talk about some of the engagement process that HCD has been going through with the next uh, regional housing needs assessment. But I wanted to start with a little bit of the legal framework. Um, and again, you know, Sam could jump into any questions later if you guys have about this, but it does start with our regional consultation process that we as SANDAC do with the state of California's housing and community development. And then once we've gone through consultation, they give us our, our regional housing needs determination, so the number of units that we need to plan for in our region. We, as uh, the Metropolitan Planning Organization, go through and um, draft our methodology, as well as um, putting forward what is the final recommended methodology, and then it moves into the allocation process, appeals at that time, and once that process is done, then we do our adoption of the final RENA plan uh, for which HCD reviews and approves, and then you guys move forward with your um, next cycle of your housing element. So most of you in this room, if not all, um, are pretty familiar with some of the statutory objectives that are put forward. Um, so these five here, I won't read through all of them, but this is what HCD is looking at uh, when they're looking at how we developed our methodology and when they're looking at how we're doing our allocation. So we look at this when we're putting, putting it forward, and this is what the state is also looking to make sure that we're achieving and furthering these five objectives uh, for RENA. So again, just you know, not to belabor the, the process, um, but again, it, it really is going from HCD down to you know, with them uh, establishing the determination, us at SANDAG working on the methodology, and then um, passing that along once the allocations are completed to the local jurisdictions, so that you can then do your housing element updates. But some of the things that I did want to highlight in particular on this slide is in the blue box. I think that we all noticed there were several changes that we went through with the six cycle. Um, we and this isn't unique to the Sandag region. This was something that was saw across the whole state of California that we saw that there was a higher uh, total need, housing need. So we saw our, our actual determination numbers were all higher than the prior cycle. There was also a bit of a greater emphasis on social equity and that really came through the affirmatively furthering fair housing and looking at how we disseminate the different income categories across the jurisdictions. And there was a lot more oversight um, in this cycle from HCD on how we were putting together our methodology, really making sure that we're furthering those five objections, objectives, and then thinking about how we plan on doing the allocations. And then I'm sure many of you, as you have gone through your six cycles, some of you still working through that, um, you've seen that there's been a lot more oversight uh, from HCD themselves and really in, um, they've been having a lot more oversight and where you're identifying eligible sites for, um, for growth. So now to just jump a little bit more into specifically what HCD is doing in terms of the engagement plan. They've been starting this process and I'll walk through a little bit of a timeline and what they have been communicating in terms of how they want to see engagement move forward and where they're looking for feedback. 
So just to start off, um, what's allowed and, and really the um, the framework, legal framework for what's how they're moving forward with this reform is through AB 101, so Assembly Bill 101. And this is really directing HCD how they are able to move forward and doing RENA reform. They're really looking at the RENA process and methodology and how they can promote and streamline housing development and sustainably address California's housing shortage overall. They are uh, required to go back and submit a report on their findings or recommendations to the legislator at the end of this calendar year. And the efforts, and this is something I do want to emphasize, the efforts that they're doing in terms of the reform and where they're looking for feedback, it is focused on the determination process and the allocation processes. So this isn't looking at your housing elements specifically and saying how they would want to reform any of that process itself. They're just looking at RENA um, determination as well as the, the allocation. And they are um, doing their stakeholder engagement between March and September, and I have a slide that'll talk a little bit more about what specifically they've done. So HCD, in terms of the stakeholder engagement, this is uh, really where they see the focus of how they want to engage with uh, metropolitan planning organizations, local jurisdictions. The engagement process is open for anyone to participate in, so it's not something that's specifically closed off to Council of Governments, MPOs, or local jurisdictions. Really, anyone can weigh in on this process, but they're wanting to make sure that they're finding ways to better capture existing and projected housing needs. And so I'll walk through some of the questions they've been asking in the survey that talks about that. Uh, they are also have recognized, I think many of us, and particularly at the Council of Government and Metropolitan Planning Organization, have talked about the amount of time that it takes to go through this process. And so they're looking to um, really increase transparency, accountability, because it does seem to come off very confusing to people who are on the outside and particularly elected officials who are trying to understand this process that only happens every eight years. And then they're, they really want to focus on strategies that can build on some of the things they feel were important adjustments during um, the sixth cycle. As I mentioned, the sixth cycle, social equity had a bigger emphasis. And so they want to continue to emphasize that as they move forward with this reform. So timeline. So this is the timeline for which HCD has put forward for how they are wanting to do the engagement. They started this in March of this year. On March 9th, they had a webinar where they kicked it off and, and kind of went through some of the information that I've shared here and, and a little bit of other details on what they're hoping to achieve with RENA reform. This is also available on their website, which I'll show at the end of the presentation. So if you'd like to go back and view what they presented. They also had a public survey that was made available um, through the months of March and May where they were receive, asking questions and receiving feedback. And then in May and June, they did four sounding boards with technical experts, and that was from um, staff from different COGS, MPOs, academia, um, different you know, advocacy groups, where they pulled them together to just talk about some of the questions that they had in their survey and to get some additional feedback. And this July, so hopefully here shortly, um, they're going to be giving a summary of just the outreach um, that they received. So the information that they've been receiving through their outreach, they're going to give an update to the legislator to talk about what they've been hearing. So it's not making recommendations at this point, it's just giving a summary. And then in September 15th, this is when they have um, asked that if anyone has any final comments that you're wanting to be you know, considered before they make any final recommendations in December. This is the timeline that they feel that if you need to make any additional comments, you want to make it before the 15th or by the 15th of September so that they have an opportunity to meaningfully um, you know, take, your, take your recommendations or your um, input into consideration before they go to the legislator with um, final recommendations in December. So SANDAG as an MPO, um, We've been trying to help keep track of, of all of this information and sharing it with our local jurisdictions. We've been doing some of this through our local TA um, technical assistance program that you heard about uh, from Carrie earlier uh, today. But in the month of April and May, we did share the online survey. We shared it through our board members. We shared it to this uh, working group, as well as we have our technical assistance program where we work with a lot of your housing staff. So we made sure that we sent this information out so that they were able to 
to see it, fill it out. And certainly if your jurisdiction wanted to give some input, um, some of you may have saw me and some of my staff on May 10th, where through that technical assistance program, we did a webinar just to talk about it a little bit more, make sure that you all were aware of the survey and the contents that were within it. And we also asked that if you had specific things that you were wanting us to either pass along through sounding board meetings or things that we can also be mindful of um, to be aware of kind of the pulse of what's happening here at the local level uh, to share that feedback with us as well. We're here today to give this update and presentation. Uh, we'll be going to our, there's a joint meeting or a regional planning committee and executive committee on July 14th. So we'll go and, and give this very same presentation to them, providing them any comments maybe that we hear today from you. And then one thing that we hope to put on your calendars is an update um, once we see what the summary of the outreach and education is to the legislator. We wanna come back and make sure that we're um, giving that update to some of your staff so that they can be made aware of what are they reporting to the legislator, what's being heard across the state of California. And then depending on the timing of when they go to the legislator with the final recommendations, we'll um, come back and try and give you a summary of what those recommendations are and what we see that meaning for our region. So just going specifically into the sounding board um, conversation and topics, uh, you know, I know that I had heard, and I think, you know, some of the other jurisdictions had heard that there was some disappointment that those meetings weren't recorded or publicly available. They do have some of the materials for the agenda uh, available online. But um, in general, those sessions were primarily just um, more conversation on the things that were in the survey. So if you do have, if you didn't get a chance to take the survey, they still would be open to receiving your feedback. And there's an email at the end of my presentation. And we're happy to send all of that out to each of you where you can still provide a letter or you can provide comments to them um, written, even if you didn't get to do the actual survey. But the conversations and the agenda topics for those sounding board, these um, bullets that I have listed here were generally the same things that you saw in the survey. And just kind of walking through each of them, they're really looking to understand how they can start to, if there's a way to use the, the RENA process to account for our unhoused populations. You know, the homelessness population uh, obviously is something here in the San Diego region that many of you are tackling and, and your city councils are talking about this quite often. And so they're wanting to understand, is RENA an opportunity for us to capture that uh, and being able to account for our unhoused populations. They also talked about a lot of other group quarters um, from our prison system, as well as to nursing homes, our universities. These are all considered group um, quarters and they wanna know should we, you know, is there interest in using RENA as an opportunity to capture that need or if it should be kept separate? So that's some of the conversations that were had around that. Um, the RENA methodology itself, they're wanting opportunities to understand if there are opportunities to improve the methodology, the data that's used, should local data sets be included, should it be mostly um, publicly available? And then there's also uh, a clear understanding that they feel that there's a need to really increase the public's understanding of what is HCD's process. Um, part of the conversations that I recall from some of the sounding board meetings is that while we as the MPOs and the COGS have to have our discussions about the methodology in our public forums, the determination, so us understanding what is the number of units we get um, and how HCD comes up with that process, that doesn't seem to be very well understood by the public. And so they're looking at opportunities for how they could improve that. Um, just to continue to emphasize that affirmatively furthering fair housing, as well as furthering all of those five statutory objectives that I mentioned earlier is very important to uh, the state. And so they're looking at, you know, they're asking questions around how should they elevate and uplift that more, uh, if different mapping tools would be helpful in helping them us to be able to achieve that. Uh, they also were asking if there are things such as minimum benchmarks that should be established around some of those statutory objectives, um, those five statutory objectives that I mentioned earlier. And then something that um, I don't know came with the, the best support from all of the different participants in the, um, the sounding board meetings, particularly some of the MPO staff, but they asked if there should be language that's amended uh, related to how they work with us as the MPO on our methodology. If they feel our, we're not meeting those objectives, should they just come in and adjust our, our methodology or should they work with us um, to adjust our methodology? So, and then a couple other things that they had in their survey and in the sounding board meetings is really 
you know, looking at our sustainable community strategy and our transportation planning efforts related to the regional housing needs assessment and how can we find ways to have better alignment um, between these two processes for our region, as most all here in California. Our SCS and regional plan is done on every four year cycle. Our arena is done every eight years. They're not always naturally um, synced up in the best way. And so looking for opportunities to have better alignment between, between the two. And then uh, really also trying to promote a more resilient region. They recognize and had several questions around how do you deal with um, areas that have like extreme, you know, wildfire events or extreme heat, sea level rise, and, and should those things be considered as they're determining um, the determination? Should they shift where those number of units should go to different parts within the same region? Or should they simply say that these are areas that we don't want to continue to invest in building in? So these are just some of the questions that they're asking and that they're looking for feedback as they uh, go through the Reno reform process. So those were the questions uh, in a nutshell or that they're asking in the sounding board meetings. As I said, the sounding board meetings, the topics were primarily the exact same thing that they were asking in the survey. So if you did get a chance to fill out the survey, um, that is the same conversation that they're having right now across the state. They say that they have additional opportunities for which you can um, participate. So I'm sure that we can expect to see and we'll certainly pass the information along as it becomes available. If they host additional webinars or they have different um, you know, types of sounding board meetings as they start to continue to move further towards the final recommendations. But as I said in the beginning, if you did not get a chance to participate in the survey, this um, CA Housing Future 2040, email here on the screen. This is still an opportunity for you to submit any of your feedback or comments to the state on this RENA reform process. So if you can get your comments into them before September 15th, then that is the date that they're asking so that they can make sure that they receive anyone's feedback and comments before they start making final recommendations to the legislator uh, in December. And if you wouldn't mind sharing your recommendations or your feedback with us at SANDAG so that we can make sure we understand what are the needs and the comments of our local jurisdictions, uh, we also put our email up here at housing at sandag.org so that we can make sure that we're um, staying in sync with the comments and feedback that you're giving to the state. And certainly their website is up there if you'd like to go there and get more information. So with that concludes my presentation, Chair, and I'd be happy to take questions or, or comments. Thank you to, uh, to Ari, to get your name right, thank you. <laughs> um, uh, first, we'll start with working group questions and comments. Uh, is there anything from the working group? I'll start with Amanda. Thank you. And thank you to Ari. You've been awesome on this. A um, couple just observations. It appears that HCD is trying to push too much into RENA. RENA is what it is. We already know it's very difficult. Makes sense to keep these as separate topics for us to address. We have a huge checklist we go through for the housing element. Much better to keep those separated because it is so different with all the jurisdictions. And second observation, that was a very poorly drafted survey <laughs> that they put. They need a professional survey. It was too much steering to one direction. So there were limited choices, limited space for responses. You can complete the survey until you figured out you had too many characters in the box. Um, so they definitely need a better way um, to go through the outreach. And I, I would say, you know, for our region, I think using the data science group from Sandag would be great. Because I think one of the big criticisms, and, and I know you hear this at the executive meetings from our mayor and council, um, the data needs to be able to be replicated and validated. And particularly with the jobs numbers, there were numbers that wasn't able, it wasn't able to be um, shared with the public. And so then you lose that confidence in where it's going. And there have, you know, there continues to be questions on the numbers for jobs. So just wanted to point that out. Thanks. Constructive feedback. Any other questions and comments? Yes, um, Jesse. Hi, thanks to Ari. Um, I'd just like to echo Amanda's comments on the survey. We felt it was very kind of skewed towards, towards one way. Um, and also I just wanted to confirm, did I hear right that they're thinking about considering group quarters and those people being unhoused and you would have to find housing for those people? Yes, that's a question that they're asking. Um, so I'll just let you know, I don't know that that was necessarily in the sounding board meetings uh, received in the, the best way. And I think for from the MPO's perspective, um, some of the comments that were made is it is difficult to determine in the methodology how you would put a methodology behind that and allocate it. 
Um, so, but that doesn't mean that the state will take all of that feedback and, and do it that way. But, but yeah, that, that's what they're asking is should we include group, group quarters or keep them separate? Okay, so for the city of Coronado, there's a lot of military um, barracks there that are considered group quarters, and we would we would strongly oppose that. So if you want to note that, that'd be great. Thank you. Other questions and comments from the working group? Yes, Lynette. Thank you, and thank you to Ari and your team. You you always do such a great job, and thank you for keeping us informed. So we definitely would like to participate more. Um, the county and I'm sure other jurisdictions in the process were not able to actively participate in the sound, sounding board. So is there an opportunity? I know at the webinar in May, there was an email provided like a Sandag housing email and some other ways to communicate. What is the best way for us to have the line of communication with Sandag, the Sandag team who is going to be actively participating in those sounding board meetings? And for that yeah. information to come back to us and time for us to provide you further comment. Yeah, so the sounding board meetings have concluded. Um, and unfortunately, they didn't post the topics uh, well enough in advance for us to disseminate that to then gather enough of the information. And they were happening at the same time as the survey was open. Um, so I, I think at this point, if anyone wants to submit further feedback to the state on the RENA reform process, we'd encourage you to send it to that CA housing future 2040 at hcd.ca.gov email, and then copy SANDAC staff so that when we are giving updates to our elected officials, when we're finding out different, you know, uh, information, we're able to communicate our region's, um, you know, interest. And then certainly I think Lynette and others have, um, have communicated that they thought the process has not been necessarily the best. So we'd be happy to follow up with the state um, staff and see if they would be open to hosting additional meetings uh, and making that more open. Thank you for that. I just have one uh, question uh, to wrap with, I think. And uh, I think about sustainability. I think about the bigger picture of this working group. And I, I, ref I want to reflect on a topic we talk about in Encinitas a lot, and that is the preservation of uh, naturally occurring or existing uh, affordable housing. And uh, could you just provide me with your insights, whether that's anywhere in the dialogue of what's being discussed in this process? Has it come forward? And I think about it in terms of sometimes um, we get so micro-focused on something, you know, meeting Rena. Yep, that's the, that's the check that box that we forget about the bigger picture. And the bigger picture is continuing to provide affordable housing options across our community. And so preservation of affordable housing may not have been or be a part of RENA, but is it anywhere in the dialogue? It's not specifically in terms of the reform. Um, I mean, certainly the state does talk about, you know, um, preserving housing, naturally occurring affordable housing. And certainly we at Sandag and, and many of your jurisdictions are looking at that, but that's not a topic within the arena reform right now. Thank you. I'll go to the left over here. Yes, thank you. Priscilla Mumpower with San Diego LAFCO. I just had a general question, um, much like yours, Chair. Um, just for informational purposes, in the dialogue, and perhaps this is a question to board members, is there any consideration of spheres of influence? And I and I ask because it, it does seem like you have a lot of factors that you're trying to um, weigh in when you're trying to allocate RENA, which seems like a very lengthy process. Does there come a point where you're looking at these allocations and think to yourself, there's gonna have to be you know, a spear amendment to our jurisdiction? Or is that even a part of the consideration or dialogue at all with either Sandag or your jurisdictions? Um, please feel free to just step in if you have something. I, I'm not sure that I can fully answer your question, um, but I guess in terms of when we get the number of units from the state that they require us to plan for, um, we do work, you know, with our staff. I think in this last cycle, and Sam can correct me if I'm wrong, I think there was a subcommittee of our board that was um, developed in order to come up with a methodology that does consider a lot of different factors and how they determine how we will take that large number and divide it up amongst our um, our cities in the county. 
And, and I think what you're saying is what are some of those considerations that go into, you know, helping us come up with the methodology and the factors and, and some of it is driven by those five statutory objectives that the state puts forward. Um, and I think we do our best to try and take, you know, considerations of uh, local input, but again, it really does end up being what the state um, directs us to do. And Sam, I don't know if you have anything you'd add. Um, yeah, I'll add, um, I don't believe that spheres of influence are, are specifically addressed in RENA or housing element law. Um, I do believe there's a requirement to consult with LAFCO regarding spheres of influence for the sustainable community strategy. Um, those processes are intended to align, but the timeframes don't always match up right. Um, I think in, in RENA cycles past, um, the SCS is, is under development um, before we have final RENA numbers established. And, and so there is an effort at the state to better align those processes. And so maybe in the future, we'll see that that issue is, is better aligned with the RENA process as well. Thank you so much. I appreciate that. Thank you. Um, yes, on the right, Heidi. Um, thank you for the presentation. Um, the city of San Diego will have um, quite a few comments that we'll be submitting to HCD um, and we'll be sure to um, copy you on the responses as well. Um, one of uh, my main comments and this ties into the last item on um, the forecast um, is this issue of units versus people housed. Um, so our biggest comment and request um, is for the RENA process to focus on outcomes of housing people um, and not so much on focus on the units for the city of San Diego in this cycle, uh, we had a RENA allocation of 108,000. That could be met through 108,400 square foot micro units that would house approximately 108,000 people. Uh, we could also um, have 108,000 three bedroom homes that would house a lot more people. Um, and specifically, um, it goes to the issue of, I think that the RENA process has unintentionally um, incentivized smaller units um, to the exclusion of families. Uh, we want families with children and intergenerational families to have housing within our jurisdiction. We want to be a city that um, has economic growth potential. Um, so to have um, arena process that um, is pushing out um, the younger generation, uh, we think that that's very problematic. Um, so, um, and then just sort of a request for a lot of um, the other member agencies here. Uh, a lot of times when we talk about units, um, it's a little bit dehumanizing. Um, and so we've really been trying to shift our focus to talking about people that we're housing or talking in terms of homes provided. Um, so we hope that um, this arena cycle process um, can be the beginning of getting us towards a conversation with our communities um, that these are not just about adding units um, that don't have people in it. Uh, these are about um, adding needed housing um, for people to continue to grow our region. A um, couple other comments um, also um, relate to um, uh, commensurate infrastructure investments um, for the RENA allocation. Um, our city um, has um, a very significant RENA allocation, um, which we are supportive of, um, but we do need um, corresponding infrastructure to be able to accommodate that additional growth. Um, and then overall, we're hoping um, for more streamlined um, housing element review process um, going through the next cycle. Okay, I'm not seeing any other hands around the working group. Um, do we have any public comment on this item? Thank you, Chair. We have one public commenter, Blair Beekman. You can go ahead. Hi, uh, Blair Beekman here. Uh, thanks a lot for this item. Uh, it was important to me. I'm I'm new to the process. I try to add what I can, but uh, I'm, I can't be limited. But uh, thank you for your patience in hearing me out in uh, ways that I, hopefully I can help contribute in any small way. Um, it was just nice to hear uh, this item that uh, we are talking more about uh, homelessness, the unhoused, and very low uh, housing development needs and ideas. Um, there is in the San Francisco Bay Area, uh, and how it works is uh, Rena is kind of the queen. I call her the queen, basically, and we we put all our main center focus on Rena housing. And and there's different agencies uh, that not just Rena can offer housing, but something that's called BAFA. Uh, it's called Bay Area uh, Housing. Uh, finance authority, 
And that works on a more experimental level with housing development ideas and concepts. I don't know if you have that similar policies down here in San Diego, but what, uh, the suggestion about uh, working with uh, current uh, living models of affordable housing ideas, that was really nice. And that Rena doesn't do that sort of thing as well at this time, which totally to me describes Rena. And it totally describes it. It's so hard for yourselves as elected officials to talk about these things with the public because you're so locked into arena, arena goals. And Rena's made things really kind of difficult for us. And it sounds like you're trying to figure out ways to open that up a bit. Thank you in the ways of choosing. Really check out the Bay Area uh, Housing Finance Authority. They're a good program that works with Arena and has a more flexibility in, in experimental choices and programs in how to work. Uh, if there's something similar in, like that in San Diego, that would be great. And of course, HD, HCD is coming down with um, really important measures about the future of uh, mixed income ideas. And um, by, I think 2029, those are kind of mandated. Um, I think that work with mixed income and how, and, and the talk of middle income housing development at this time uh, can offer a wide range of choices. We can talk about market rate housing. We can talk about uh, very low income housing development, uh, all within a mixed income package where, uh, and middle, middle income package that, uh, that allows for uh, mixed income design to really take place. And so I'm interested how middle income can help mixed income ideas in our future where very low income can live in the same places as, as, as middle and, and market rate housing. Uh, to learn that cooperative process takes time and patience to, to teach the community and, and what's possible, but you have to learn those skills. And now's the time to learn those skills. And we can work that with Tijuana, I think, wonderfully. So good luck in all those efforts. Thanks. Thank you very much for your comment. Thank you to Ari. Now we'll go to item five on the agenda, value capture in the San Diego region. I'd like to introduce Tim Garrett, San Diego Regional Planner, who will introduce the rest of the team and will um, handle the uh, presentation of this item. All right. Good afternoon, Chair Lyons and members of the Sustainable Communities Working Group. My name is Tim Garrett, Regional Planner with Sandag's uh, Strategic Partnerships Team. Um, today I'm joined by members of our consulting team on this project, including Ignacio Montojo uh, and Amitabh Bartakor from uh, HRNA, as well as Lisa Amini and Bailey Coleman from Sperry Capital, who are joining us online. So Sandag began exploring land value capture opportunities a few years ago uh, as we began to study the central mobility hub concept. So we're continuing to explore applications and better understand how this can be used in the San Diego region. So six months ago, Sandag began a land value capture study as part of our housing acceleration program. The study is helping us to develop a better understanding regionally about how we can leverage value capture and joint development to advance regional housing goals and implement the regional plan. However, Sandag can't do this alone, which is why we'll be, we will be developing policy recommendations for local jurisdictions, to consider um, in, your, in your cities. And we hope that today's discussion on our ongoing study will help us tailor these recommendations so that we can work together to provide benefits for our communities and uh, continue as we continue to make our public investments. And so I'll turn it over to Amitabh uh, to continue with some background on value capture as a concept. Great, thank you, Tim, and good afternoon, uh, working group members. I hope you can hear me. Um, uh, so I, I'm Amitabh Barthakar, as Tim mentioned, I'm a partner with HRNA Advisors. Um, HRNA is a national real estate and public policy consulting firm. And since the firm's origins in Southern California, more than 45 years ago, we have worked on a variety of assignments as it relates to value capture in California, around the country and around the world. Uh, we are the prime consultants with Sandag on this assignment and we were supported by Sperry Capital and we have Lisa Mini from Sperry Capital here, uh, and they are one of the state's leading municipal finance advisors. So here's a quick overview on the principles of land value creation and capture. This graphic is probably a little bit oversimplified, but uh, sends, uh, you know, communicates the message. 
Um, so if you look at the land development process, starting from a piece of raw land uh, to planning it, to creating entitlements on it, providing infrastructure improvements, then enabling vertical development, and finally operational real estate, there is value created in each stage of that process. Uh, there are of course costs associated with it at each stage, but the net value is greater than the cost uh, invested. Now the benefits of the value creation typically go to the property owners or developers who are making the investments in the first place. But in many cases, the public sector is also making investments um, to create this value. For example, the public sector may have led a planning process that provides um, you know, land use initiatives that give additional development rights uh, or made infrastructure improvements proximate to a particular site or a neighborhood. Um, such as transit, roads, parks, utilities, which add to significant value. And without a proactive strategy to capture or share that value created, uh, all of those benefits actually don't, none of those benefits flow to the public sector. It, it just goes to sort of private, private property owners. So value capture tools are essentially mechanisms to capture some of these incremental value created uh, often by the public sector. So it's almost like a public sector becoming a partner in this development process, making public investments and reaping some of the benefits. And those benefits can then go towards paying for uh, some of the initial infrastructure investments or uh, other amenities such as affordable housing or housing creation as the objective of the plan uh, suggests. Uh, next slide. So we looked at a number of value capture tools, um, including assessment districts, such as community facilities districts or Melarus districts as it's commonly referred to, special assessment districts, which have a nexus-based assessment. You know, there is a specific uh, benefit uh, for which you are assessing a certain property. Now, assessments are new taxes assessed on property. Sometimes they require a vote of property owners. We then looked at tax increment financing on properties which is something that we used to apply pretty liberally all across California before redevelopment agencies went away. Uh, but we looked at the current version of tax increment called Enhanced Infrastructure Financing Districts or EIFDs, as many of you may know. Uh, we looked at impact fees as well as joint development or using public land for private development. All of these instruments, except for impact fees, can potentially create a recurring revenue stream um, from using these um, instruments to the public sector partner. Uh, and those recurring revenue streams then can be coupled with financing instruments like bonds to create upfront revenues for us to invest in particular you know, mission-oriented objectives. Um, and all of these tools, except for joint development, which you know, anyone can probably do, any public agency can do, are within the purview of local jurisdictions, particularly cities and counties. Next slide. Our work started with a careful review of existing policies and case studies. Uh, what you see on this slide is the Salesforce Transit Center in San Francisco. This is a great example of value capture for two reasons. Um, the first is that the Transbay Joint Powers Authority and the city and county of San Francisco layered in multiple value capture tools to meet their objectives. Uh, there is a community facilities district, there's a tax increment financing district, which are layered on top of one another, as well as revenues from the sale and development of public properties that generate revenues to pay for the facility. And the second reason is that both HRNA and Sperry Capital worked on this project and we're, we're very proud of it. So this is just a snapshot of how um, these tools have been used across the state to deliver either infrastructure or other public benefits. Next slide. Uh, the next part of our task was to develop a set of screening tools. So we, we researched value capture tools. Then we started looking at what's happening in San Diego and, and the San Diego region and, and tried to develop a tool that helps us connect the appropriate type of value capture tool to a specific project, right? Um, these tools will help jurisdictions like yourselves evaluate the applicability and effectiveness of very specific value capture instruments on a project by project basis. This slide shows at a high level the framework that we have for the tool. 
um, which is a step process. It first looked at looked at sort of general value capture potential by answering two questions. Um, is this project eligible for value capture? Can we even do it? And if yes, is value capture suitable here? Um, you know, does the market conditions support it? Uh, do the stakeholders support it? Is there political will, et cetera? Now, if the answer to those questions is yes, then we move to the next phase of the screening, which checks into specific value capture instrument, like the instrument list that we showed in the previous slide, um, and, and, and then evaluates what can be, what is the most appropriate type of tool or tools um, that can be applied here and eventually prioritizing um, the tools that you should be spending more time on exploring. Next slide. Similarly, we prepared a similar screening matrix for joint development, um, which is you know, first checking if a particular project site is a bit eligible for joint development, and then checking the suitability in terms of the scale of revenues that could be generated and implementability. Um, this is obviously the framework of the screening tool, as I mentioned. In our deliverable, you'll find a much more detailed screening tool, which includes a set of sort of yes or no questions and some data points to help you take you through these steps and narrow down the appropriate value capture mechanism. Next slide. Next, after we developed those tools, we then started testing some of these with some pilot kind of projects just to illustrate whether those screening mechanisms as well as uh, the, the potential for value capture exists. Now, these are all illustrative uh, for, um, you know, value capture like an EIFD or a CFD. Um, we chose sort of the Kearney Mesa station area. Um, here we looked at EIFDs, which include a much larger area than just the station itself, reflecting about half of the community planning area. Um, now, if both what we found that if both the city and the county of San Diego were to contribute 100% of their tax increment in this area for a period of 45 years, the present value of the revenue stream coming out of it could be in the tune of a billion dollars. Of course, the share of revenues contributed by each jurisdiction will really depend on political considerations and their own fiscal risk evaluation. So if both jurisdictions, say, wanted to put in half of the tax increment and agree to do that, uh, it could still generate about half a billion dollars in sort of present value terms. Now, that is sort of the funding capacity. Um, this is not exactly the amount that can be financed through a bond mechanism. Sperry Capital then looked at this funding capacity and, and estimated that, um, you know, the, the bonding, the actual debt that can be issued against this revenue stream, and that can be actually available as upfront resources for investment, could be in the range of um, half a billion dollars if the 100% contribution scenario under the 100% contribution scenario, or around $200 million under the 50% contribution scenario. We also looked at sort of CFD capacity here, as well as um, you know a couple of other value capture mechanisms, which could generate additional revenues. But you sort of get the idea that the scale of revenue potential could be substantial if some of these mechanisms can be deployed. Next slide. We also applied sort of our joint development tool um, to an illustrative site. Um, you know, we looked at joint development as a pilot in the Tecolote Village uh, station area, which includes both private and public land um, that could be developed around the future station. Here we specifically looked at how potential revenues from joint development can be used to support affordable housing. Um, so Sandag, you know, owns and essentially, you know, a, a number of public properties out there of limited scale, but which could be developed about two and a half to three acres, 2.75 acres to be exact on this site. And uh, we started looking at it, what if this were to be developed with the current requirement of 15% of the total allowable units uh, be affordable? and then started calibrating sort of what, what happens if we increase the amount of affordable units, what happens if we increase the depth of affordability and see how far we can push the envelope in terms of using this land resource and using joint development as a tool to maximize sort of both housing production and affordable housing production. So this land could generate about $6 million just as an illustrative you know, scale of uh, you know, comparison to tell you that 2.75 acres could generate about $6 million at 15% affordability. 
but it could be further leveraged um, to to increase uh, the the share of affordable housing out here. And you know, just as a order of magnitude, what we found that for every additional five percent share, for every additional five percent share of um, affordable housing, the land value discount is about $2 million. So, you know, if you give up an additional $2 million from that $6 million, you could potentially get 20% affordable housing and so on and so forth. So this joint development can become a really uh, effective tool in, in leveraging, you know, in optimizing the scale of affordable housing at station areas. Next slide. So that was a quick update on where we are. We are right now in the process of compiling these this information and are ready to sort of go to the last final phase of our work, which will you know come up with some recommendations and 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 ways to use the information that we have actually compiled as part of this study. Um, that's the end of our quick presentation. Uh, I'm happy to take questions, but also um, you know, facilitate any discussion. We have some questions for discussion for you as sort of guiding questions, but I'm going to stop there. Thank you, Tim. Thanks, Amitav. And actually, if I could just add one more um, bit before turning it back to the chair. Um, the There's an example um, talked about of the, the Kearney Mesa station area, and that is a proposed or potential station area for the, the purple line, which is a proposed um, uh, commuter rail line as envisioned in the 2021 regional plan. There's still lots of planning work to be to be done on that project, um, but this is just a high level assessment early on to look at if value capture can help support um, get that project to that stage, um, help with the financing, um, leveraging the fact that a project of that scale is going to be a significant public investment. So if we can use um, value capture to um, make it easier to build and get greater public benefits, that's the purpose of that. So just wanted to add some context there. I'll turn it back to you, Chair, for uh, to lead um, any discussion. Thank you, Tim. Um, so, do we have any working group questions or comments at this time? Yes, Heidi. I just have a question about the timeline and what the deliverable is. Is this going to be in the form of a working paper or a formal report? Um, and is there going to be sample um, performas included in that for us to work from? So there, so the task order has um, several um, several deliverables. So one of them was a case studies um, review, which we can provide to you. That's been completed. There's also been um, uh, analysis of the the screening tools um, that Amitav went through for value capture and joint development. Um, the next one um, is the uh, the case studies. So it's the Kearney Mesa Station area as well as Tecolote Village. Um, and then the fifth one is going to be uh, an implementation strategy. Um, so the this, is, this presentation is coming out at a good time as we move on to that final task. So this is really the one um, where we're looking for input from jurisdictions so that it can be tailored to your needs and tailored to um, some of the challenges that would need to be overcome um, politically, um, technically. Um, so yeah, the, the final task is kind of, uh, it's, still, it's still being formed. And so hopefully that discussion will today will inform that. Yeah. Um, I think it was one slide back, there was kind of the examples and it seems like you looked at 5% increments for affordable housing requirements. And I'm assuming there was some sort of sensitivity analysis that was performed there. So that's interesting um, to me and something that I think would be helpful. And I would suggest even um, doing a little bit more um, of a granular sensitivity analysis, maybe by 2.5% increments um, there, um, just to provide different variables. Yeah, the, um, the, the task for deliverable, it does have a bit more detail um, and invite Ignacio or other, other members from the consulting team to add some more detail. Yeah, and thanks, Tim, and, and um, thanks for the question. Uh, the deliverable actually does include exactly that. You can see uh, Proforma with uh, those sensitivities, and I, I'm, I'm kind of oversimplifying this one of the takeaways. So we did look at a number of sensitivities um, both on this as well as the uh, the EIFD scenario and the CFD scenarios. And those performas are actually attached to the deliverables. And then I just have one follow-up request for that. Um, for the performas, um, it would be helpful to the jurisdictions if we could get the Excel um, spreadsheet so that we can play around with the assumptions as it may be applicable to us. And that's a tool that would be very helpful to us.
specific team performance, we have uh, the, the we have uh, two sets of performance. The, the first Excel model is the one we use in test three, which is the framework for screening what value capture tools might be applicable to your projects and how you go about evaluating um, if a site has joint development potential and what that joint development potential might be. That's more sort of a qualitative scan for you to understand whether a project has potential for value capture and joint development. So that's one uh, uh, Excel spreadsheet that can be available, I think, in short order in, in, in its current form. Um, then there is the financial model for the two case studies, which were Kearney Mesa and uh, Tecolote. Uh, that's more sort of a projection of, of revenue uh, from applying value capture and development to those two projects. Um, and, and that, um, I think, yeah, that, that might take maybe a little bit more time for us to, 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 to I guess, uh, yeah, finalize and, and, and clean up, but just want to mention there are those two sort of different tools as a result of this work. Thanks, Ignacio. Thank you. Good question. Other questions? One thing that I'm wondering is, could you, um, I'm going to be a few pretty big steps backwards in my understanding of these tools. Um, could you characterize for me what some of the downsides might be to the increment financing? I understand that it's a way to generate money for specific housing uh, opportunities. I understand um, that need to be the political will behind uh, diverting tax. Uh, what are the, what are the, what other downsides are there? So, I, I mean, I wouldn't say downsides, um, and I would, you know, I would ask also Lisa um, Amini to uh, chime in. Um, this is a, a, as you know, we we used to use. California used to use tax and financing pretty liberally across the state when we had redevelopment agencies. Uh, and those, you know, I'm oversimplifying here, but uh, you know, one of the one of the requirements within those was one, there was a, there needed to be a finding of blight, you know, as per redevelopment law. And but read the tax increment actually that went into a tax increment financing project. Was was mandatory that the county and um, and the cities where the tax uh, where the projects are will contribute all of the tax increment into the tax increment financing district. Under the new law, the EIFD law, this is kind of voluntary. Um, so if a city initiates, and depending on how much the city wants to contribute, if a county wants to come and join them, how much they want to contribute, all of this is up for negotiation. Uh, and the impact of this tax increment district is really dependent on how much increment each entity is contributing. So that's like that's something that needs to be negotiated. It's kind of political. It really, uh, you know, each jurisdiction will have to evaluate their own fiscal conditions and and commit to that, et cetera, et cetera. So that's like a practical change, which creates a, uh, I would say, not a hurdle, but it's a it's a a little bit of a barrier than the mandatory required for. Um, the the second issue with tax increment generally is that unless there's a project already there and there's a lot of development that's going on, there it can be a slow process of of actually revenue generation because you know tax increment is compounds over time. So it's not like as opposed to an assessment district where you can start generating, you can assessing, start assessing properties right now and money starts coming in right away. Tax increment can take time because it follows development patterns. And you know, Prop 13 sometimes sort of you know uh, depresses that kind of assess valuation growth, but it's really contingent upon that. So the financing capacity, the upfront money that's available is really dependent on the pace of development that may happen out there, as well as how kind of the bond markets view that uh, particular project area. Lisa, you have anything to add to that? Well, I mean, I, Amitabh, I think you covered it uh, really well. I think that one is that the ta contributing tax increments voluntary. So, so each entity that's contributing is gonna wanna make sure that there's a net fiscal benefit that by doing it, you're gonna end up getting back more in the long run on a present value basis than, than you're giving away. Um, so it's for a purpose, um, shaping development, shaping housing, making infrastructure investments. And then, then the other is it does take, take a long time before you can actually finance something. For example, in Salesforce Transit Center, uh, the planning all took place 
really early on um, to set the stage for these value capture tools. I think the first the first piece of land was sold in 2013, but it was like a handful of years later before uh, tax increments started rolling in because assessment values are on the rolls and generating taxes. And then another couple of years before we could actually do a debt financing. So it does take time. And that's that's something that needs to be planned for early. Thank you. Uh, seeing no other questions around the working group, I'll ask if there's a, any public speakers, Francesca? Thank you, Chair. We have no public speakers on this item. All right. Thank you, Tim, and your team. Thank you. Proceeding on to item number six, upcoming meetings. Our next regular working group meeting is scheduled for July 27th at 10 a.m. as part of a joint working group forum on the 2025 regional plan. Uh, the meeting will be held at the San Diego uh, library. And um, as a reminder, if any working group member has a suggestion for future topics, please email Carrie or Tueri to share your thoughts on such topics. Um, and just one last uh, question to our clerk, Francesca. Are there any other members of the public who wish to speak on this item? Thank you, Chair. We have no additional public comments. Okay, uh, with that, we'll adjourn this meeting. <laughs>